Hello, it's Ryan again, back with a, another MATLAB tutorial video. This time I want to get across to you something that's called flow control in computer science parlance. This is the idea that instruction or information flows through a computer code. So we're going to talk about uh, one type of flow called a for loop, where you just have a computer repeat a process for a certain number of times. And we're also going to talk about an if condition, or an if statement, where you have some condition, and if it's true, the computer does one thing, and if it's false, the computer does another thing, and then after that's happened, it moves on to the rest of the code. But the idea is that we can control the flow of inform information through a computer script. To do this, we're going to, in MATLAB, set up an integrator. In class last Friday, you set up an integrator uh, that used Euler's method. Here we're going to use a more advanced method called leapfrog. Now the idea of leapfrog is that you update your position at integer times. So let's make this a note. Leapfrog uh, Newton's equations of motion. So we will update position at integer time. Update velocity at half integer time. So if we update our position at time 2, we will update our velocity at time 2.5. And, and we'll move the way to think about that. And we're going to do this for a more complicated problem than you did in class. So you did a one-dimensional problem uh, with a force. We're going to do two dimensions. So we're actually going to do a projectile launched at 45 degrees with air resistance. So this will be a more complicated problem. And we will do this with a for loop and an if statement to make sure that something unphysical doesn't happen. Now, as I mentioned last time, the first thing we want to do is clear all of our variables. And then we're going to start establishing force constants. So for gravity, uh, we know that the acceleration due to gravity is negative 9.8 meters per second squared on Earth. Earth's field and we're going to set up a force constant for our friction or air resistance and I'm just going to call it 5 right now um, you can play around with that later and try to figure out what physical constants might look like here what unphysical constants might look like because we're going to have the computer plot this and you should have some intuition about what those plots should look like for a projectile so drag coefficient and MATLAB is telling me that I did not terminate statement with semicolon. Let's do this for 10 seconds and we'll divide up our time into, you can do this a bunch, let's say 1001 steps. We're going to write this so that you can change these things and play around with that. The code will still run. And then I need to think about my dt, so my very small time steps. How, how far uh, in advance in time do I want the computer to think? So we'll take that time and divide it up by our number of steps. Uh, but for the purposes of this, one, we're giving the computer step one, so it doesn't need to worry about that. And two, think about if I had a pie and I made three slices, then I'm going to have uh, four pieces of pie. Or maybe think about that as like a a rope. If I cut the rope three times, I'll have three, four slices of rope. Three cuts, four slices. So I want 1,001 steps, and I need to cut that time 1,000 times, so step minus one. I'll also assign overall initial velocity. Um, again, semicolons. Now we're going to divide this up into x and y because we're doing projectile motion. Let's have that be 10 meters per second, and we're going to launch it at an angle theta of 45 degrees. Now hopefully you remember all of the physics I'm going to use from intro physics, um, 113. But if not, remember the purpose of this video is to actually think about flow control, uh, the for and if statement. So it's important that you understand the physics, but I'm going to gloss over that a bit in this video in favor of making sure you get how a for loop works and how an if statement works. Now we need our velocities divided into x and y. So I'm going to take that uh, v naught 
and say that my velocity at my first time step, remember MATLAB does one based indexing, it won't understand what it means to have a zeroth entry in a vector, so time zero is actually going to be one in this. And we need to divide up our v naught. The way we do that is with sine and cosine. So x would be cosine theta. And notice all I did was divide this up into radians instead of degrees. And y one v naught times sine theta. And we'll state our initial positions in x and in y. Now you can have this be anywhere. Um, so just to prove that point, we will have it start not on the ground. And you can go back and play with that later. Zero. So this is our initial time is zero. And then we'll have an acceleration in x. And notice this acceleration in x will change with time because of our drag coefficient. We have a velocity dependent force. Um, that's how air resistance works. So this will actually be changing in time as a function of velocity in x. And the same thing for y. We have, of course, gravity, but we have a velocity dependent force. We're doing air resistance here. All right, now we get to the real meat of the problem as far as the computer science. So I want to have the computer calculate our position, velocity, acceleration at every step. So I'm going to do a for loop, and we're going to run it from 1 to steps minus 1. And right now MATLAB is just saying there's not an equivalent end, so I have to end my loop somewhere. Otherwise the computer won't know which code belongs inside that loop or outside that loop. So my time is going to increase in each step by dt. Oops. So I'll take my old time, add dt to it to get my new time. And now MATLAB's going to say you have something growing in a loop. So if we were using good computer programming practice, we would have declared how big the variable t was to start with, and MATLAB would allocate space and memory. Um, not so much the point of this class, but know that that's what MATLAB is telling us. We should have allocated space and memory for t before we started. And then we will update our position. So remember we're updating the position at integer time. So x i v x i times dt plus ax i times dt squared times a half. So just the typical equation of position from kinematics. And then, because we're going to update our velocity at half a time, we need to go ahead and know what our next acceleration is to use in that velocity. So a at i plus 1 equals negative b times vxi. And then we will get our next velocity updated using the information at a half integer time. You'll see what I mean by that. So I'm going to take acceleration at i and add the next acceleration and multiply by a half. So I actually update position at one time and then velocity you could think of as at time plus a half. Because we took our acceleration that was used in our position, added the next acceleration and averaged the two when updating our velocity. And that's what I mean by updating position at integer time and velocity at half integer time. Now I did all of x. Obviously we need to do y as well. Um, time carries across. I could restate my update of time, but that isn't necessary. So I will update my y position.
oops, sorry. Uh, I was thinking about time from my last statement. So see, all I'm doing is filling out the y version of the kinematic equation. Nothing exciting happening there. And I will now update my acceleration y because I need to know the next acceleration to update my time. Okay, so what have I done? I have updated my x position, acceleration, and velocity. I've updated my y position, acceleration, and velocity. Now, remember I said this video is really about flow control. Um, there is something that physically can't or is very unlikely to happen. So if this projectile hits the ground, it's going to stop moving. And that's how we judge our maximum x position. If you remember deriving the range equation in 113, you stop when your projectile hits the ground. So we need to tell the computer to do the same thing. We will say if y i plus 1, so if our next time step is going to have y underground, so less than 0, we're just going to exit this loop. Otherwise we'll keep going. So if y is less than 0, stop running this loop, otherwise just keep going. And that is all we need. We're going to update our equations in motion at every time step, and then we're going to plot them. So let's make figure 1 be time um, and position, so remember it's x comma y. Figure 2, let's plot y as a function of time, and figure 3, let's plot x versus y. And now let's see what happened. Now I wrote all that without checking anything along the way. Good coding practice would have been every few lines to hit run to make sure it was working so far. So I'll probably have some errors. Let's see what happens. I'm telling me I didn't save it. So this is leapfrog. Uh, with Newton's equations of motion. So instead of using the Euler integrator, we're using the leapfrog integrator scheme. All right. Undefined function of variable v0. Oh, vo. That's the problem. I mixed up o's and zeros. Let's see if that was the only place I did that. I'm having this do a lot of steps. Let's try to interpret what happened here. So figure one is x and t. All right. Now this would mean that my x velocity eventually went to zero. So at some point my position just starts staying the same. Okay. And Let's see if that bears out. So according to my plot of x versus time, uh, my velocity, my x velocity at some point went to zero. And let's look at y versus time. So this says that we had it going up and then eventually hitting the ground. Now that makes sense to me. Um, so this thing was shot up, eventually the y velocity went to zero, 
and then it hits the ground. But this indicates that we stopped moving in X before we stopped moving in Y. So at some point it just went straight down. All right, let's see. How can we make more sense of this? Let's plot, let's start at Y equals zero and see if we can return to the ground. See if I did anything weird here. All right. So once again, we have X velocity slowly dropping off. And this time we went up and came down. And it didn't take very long. That's interesting. So this says this took 9 tenths of a second. Hmm. So nothing is striking me as crazy. Um, let's do this without error resistance and see if we just get typical projectile motion. And we do. Um, that was pretty fast. I'll do it again. So let me close all my figures just so you believe me. Now I've set this to no air resistance, which means I should just get a parabola for um, for y. All right. So y versus time. We go up, come back down, and uh, x and y. Up, come back down. So this makes sense to me. I think this code is working. Uh, a couple things I would encourage you to do. If you follow along, change our drag coefficient. You can change to a different uh, planet by altering gravitational field. Maybe run for longer, run for more steps. Notice that we didn't even get close to running for the whole 10 seconds. The loop breaks way before that. So let's see if I can get higher resolution on just one second, for example. Now all those steps will go into one second. Oh, my mistake. It was using more than one second. There we go. Hmm. Still hold 10 seconds. Oops. Do 10 seconds again. Okay, so I need a graph that's versus time. All right, one and a half seconds is how long that's running for. Before it says that the projectile is at the ground. So everything makes sense to me. Um, those initial graphs were a little weird. That's why I got a little concerned. But maybe go through this, check to see if I did everything right. Um, and again, the point is to make sure you understand flow control. Play around with these. Maybe also plot velocity versus time. That could be a good exercise and make sure that the velocities are in fact matching the position graphs. They are the slope or first derivative of the position graphs. Uh, some things to check. And that's all.